Hi, and welcome to the CIPD Central London event, how to get promoted to a management position in HR. We're absolutely delighted you've given your lunch time up to join us today. Um, and today is all about basically how you can use this CIPD profession map to just accelerate your career. So no matter where you are, whatever your generalism, whatever your specialism in HR, this is just a really useful session for you where we're going to just give you loads of really rich insight about the profession map, break it down, give you strategies that you can actually use immediately just to help you navigate your way through your career. So we've got two brilliant guests to actually guide us through this process. We've got Miriam Stevens from the CIPD um, and she's pretty much the person that invented and designed the CIPD profession map. And we've got Natalie Ellis from Rebox HR and she's the woman that actually wrote the book about the CIPD profession map and how you can use it to get ahead in your career. Um, my name is Garen Rauch and I'm the um, CIPD Central London Vice Chair. Um, I'm also joined by Valentin De Laurentiis, who's worked extremely hard to help organise today's event. So thank you so much for all your hard work, Valentina. So looking at today's session, as I said, it's a really fast paced interactive session. Um, you're going to have loads of opportunities to ask all the questions that you have either about the profession map um, or about your own career and where you are right now and what you might want to do to actually take those next few steps. Um, I've personally, I've just got extreme amounts of value from the CIPD profession map. Um, I've used it um, when I got my chartership. And also as an OD practitioner, I regularly go back to it. And it just reminds me of just what the standards I should be implementing. It encourages me to be more strategic in my role. Um, so I would always just sign people to, people to the, the HR profession map and just have a look around. It's just such a great resource. So let's just introduce our two guests. So Miriam Stevens um, from the CIPD has 22 years experience in the people profession, um, and that's been spent in talent and L&D and OD, so a really good all rounder. Um, she's the new head of organization assessment and CPD for the CIPD, that's a mouthful. Um, and she's also uh, helps assess people teams against the profession map standards. She's, so she's out in the field working with HR teams and helping them assess their capability and what they need to do next to keep going. So uh, just a really rich experience we can tap into today. Um, she, as we mentioned, she did design and develop the profession map and also the non-qualification routes into membership. So whatever your background today, um, she will have some insights for you and, and just some personal fun facts about her she's a huge f1 fan um, and the owner of two cats um, our second guest is natalie ellis from rebox hr um, she's an hr consultant but also prior to that she was an hr manager with extensive experience and currently services uh, 60 clients um, across the uk um, as i mentioned she wrote the book launch your hr career um, and that's the book that kind of sort of shares her experience of how she got ahead in HR. Um, and she also won Best Virtual Consultancy in November 2020. Um, and some fun facts about her. She's the owner of two French Bulldogs uh, and is often referred to as the HR Spice Girl. So let's just take you through the roadmap for today. So the first thing we're going to do is introduce you and take you through the CIP profession map. If, you, if you've seen the profession map, we're going to give you some, uh, Miriam's going to say it, share some great insights and just really useful information about how you can use it. The next thing we're going to do is we're then going to um, shift gears and we're going to talk to Natalie and she's going to share tips and tacks and tips and strategies about how to use the map and to move into an HR management role and she'll also be sharing some of her experiences as well and then throughout this this time we're going to be inviting you to put some questions in the chat box um, you can either put them straight in the public chat box or you can message Miriam or Natalie directly you'd rather do that and we'll do some really good Q&A um, so be greedy ask the questions that you want get the value that you need from today as well and for those of you that are actually in person today, not the guys actually watching this on YouTube, uh, but we're doing some breakout room exercises and we'll be spinning you off into um, breakout rooms with fellow HR practitioners. Uh, you can exchange some ideas and that's all in the service of actually developing your own personal action plan that you can take away from today and implement immediately. So without further ado, um, we're just going to get straight into it um, and just hear straight from Miriam, um, who's going to take us through the um, profession map. Thanks, Miriam. Hi everyone, um, I'm Miriam Stevens. Um, I think I actually said I was owned by two cats, not that I own two cats, I don't think anyone owns cats. Um, but, uh, but yes, and uh, Formula One, definitely my passion. But my work passion, uh, my work focus uh, is very much around um, organisation assessment and how we use the profession map to think about capability building within the people profession. Um, so that's what I'm going to share with you today. I've got 15 minutes um, and I'm going to whiz through. So yes, so the profession map. Um, 
So we, the profession map has been around uh, quite a long time, uh, but we did a sort of full review back in 2018, and it's now in the format that you will um, you'll now see it. Um, so I'm going to share with you kind of how it works, um, how we use it, and just share a couple of ways that you can use it to think about um, developing yourself, either from a, your current role perspective or thinking about uh, your career. It's just gone. So um, that's what it looks like. We like to affectionately call it the rainbow image at the CIPD. I think it looks more like a wig, but uh, you can debate that. But what the profession map does really is set out the international standard for people professionals to make their greatest impact and thrive in a changing world of work. And you can see there in the purple section in the middle, we've got the purpose, which is to champion better work and working lives. That's the purpose of our profession. We have three values in pale purple around that. So we have a uh, 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 values of being evidence-based, uh, principles-led and outcomes-driven, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later on. But the things in green are the things that probably we talk about most when we think about how you use uh, the profession map in your own role or to develop yourself, and that's we have standards around core knowledge, core behaviours and specialist knowledge. So I'm going to go through those um, briefly now. Um, so core knowledge, this is the first area. So Core knowledge areas, which I'll share some of those with you in a minute, core knowledge areas apply to everyone. They're areas of knowledge that regardless of your role, whether you're an HR generalist, whether you're an L&D specialist or an OD administrator or um, a head of reward, it doesn't matter what your specialism or, or generalism, all the core knowledge areas apply to you. The areas that are foundational to how you, um, how you think about the world around you and apply that knowledge in the context of your role and your work. We then have core behaviours, um, and again, the word would suggest core, they're core to everyone. Again, all people professionals need to know how to use the core behaviours. And the core behaviours were really designed to say, okay, which behaviours will most allow you to live the values? So which behaviours will most allow you and drive you to being principles-led, evidence-based and outcomes-driven? Um, and then we have specialist knowledge, um, and I'll share some of those areas with you in a moment, but the specialist knowledge areas really are dependent on your role. So whether you are, um, again, as I said, a, a, a business partner, or whether you're a specialist in talent or L&D or reward or well-being, they apply to you and you have to use them in a way that makes sense for your role and is pragmatic for your role. So let's have a look at some of these areas so you can see what they look like. Hopefully you can see them on the screen there. Um, but the core knowledge areas, you can see there some areas you would expect, people practice, culture and behaviour, so there's quite a strong OD focus now in the core of the map, and um, business acumen, so how you understand your organisation or organisations you work with, evidence-based practice, absolutely critical, how do I take an evidence-based approach to my work, understanding technology and the impact on people and understanding how to manage change and how to drive and own change. So those are those core knowledge areas that apply to you regardless of your role. We then have core behaviours, um, and I'll just go through some of them here. So ethical practice, that was a new one that we introduced in, in, in 2018. Um, professional courage and influence, valuing people, really important, how you work inclusively, um, commercial drive, passion for learning, insights focused and situation decisional make, uh, situational decision making. And hopefully you can see how those core behaviours uh, would enable you to um, live some of those values. Um, and then we have the specialist knowledge. So um, we have areas around employee experience, uh, employee relations, inclusion and diversity, L&D reward, talent resourcing, OD&D and people analytics. Now I said before, you need to use the specialist knowledge as is appropriate for your role. So if you're a talent professional, for example, some talent professionals look at the whole gamut of resourcing all the way through to succession planning, um, high potential development, for example. So if you're a talent professional, you actually might need to use the resourcing and the talent management and maybe even the L&D specialist areas, and you might touch on those in different ways. Other talent specialists might purely just look at resourcing and you just need to take the resourcing area. If you're a business partner, you might find none of these specialist areas apply to you and you just focus on the core. Equally, if you're a business partner and um, you know you're going to be doing a lot of restructuring um, and OD work in the next year, you might choose to look at and focus on OD for a while. So use the specialisms as they work for you. Some of them will be deep dive for you, some of them you might just lightly touch on, but the core are the really key critical ones for, for, for all professionals. 
So um, if you were to look underneath any of those areas, so underneath people practice, underneath one of the behaviours, underneath one of the specialisms, you would find a set of standards. And this is literally what they look like on our website. So this is what you would see. Um, and you would see, you can see there are four levels that go across uh, left to right. And I'm going to talk about the levels in a moment. But you can see this foundation level, associate level, chartered member level, chartered fellow level, and they mirror exactly our requirements for foundation membership, associate membership, chartered membership and chartered fellowship, which is good. Otherwise, it would be a bit mad. Um, but you can see underneath. So let's take the associate level as an example. Um, if you look underneath there, you'll see the first standard there says contribute to discussions and respond to questions in an informed and confident way. So that's one of the behavioural standards under professional courage and influence that we would expect an associate to demonstrate. And again, you can read down those columns. But this is what it looks like if you were to lift up any of those areas on the map and say, well, what's underneath? You will see a set of standards like this um, at four levels. Now, the levels are really, really important. And they're really important partly because they help you to navigate the map. But also they're important because if you're thinking about your development and your career and what you want to do next, they're a really good way of thinking about how do you want to get there and actually what are your career aspirations? And I'll say this now, um, I'll go on to look at the impact levels. If, if, if your career development, and I know other people will echo this in the conversations today, you do not have to move through all these levels or move in a linear fashion or try and get to the most senior role to develop your career. Some people will, and some people will want to, and some people will have the capability to do that, and some people will be in the right roles to enable them to do that, but that doesn't mean it's right for everyone. There will be plenty of people who will be, for example, at foundation level or associate level or at chartered member level and be very happy in that role, at that level, in the work that they're doing. And they can develop, you can develop your career at a, at a, um, in a kind of horizontal way where you broaden and um, deepen your knowledge at the level you're at in a variety of different roles, in a variety of different specialisms. Your career trajectory does not have to be linear if that's not what you're interested in developing. So I think it's really important to say that. And, and equally, your career trajectory might be to go out of the people profession and learn about other stuff and come back in again at a later date. So there are all sorts of ways you can develop your career. So what I would encourage you to do is to not necessarily think about your career in a linear fashion where you're thinking about, well, I'm an administrator now, then I want to be an advisor, then I want to be an officer, then I want to be a manager. Then I, That might be where you want to go, but it doesn't have to be if that's not right for you. Um, so I do just want to emphasize that. And equally, some people might want to be independent consultants. So, you know, your career can take you in all sorts of different directions. So the way we've developed these levels really is to reflect different types of um, roles and levels within the people profession. And we do tend to use the term people profession. If I use the term HR in any of this, that includes the whole of the profession. So that includes L&D and OD, it's, it's just a language thing. Um, but we develop these levels to reflect broadly the types of levels that we find in the profession. So this was done based on research that we have with, with lots of organizations and clients. And the first thing to say is that these levels are not based on the sort of um, construct of mastery. So it's not that, you know, when you move from, and, and I'm not talking about membership here either, I'm just talking about demonstrating the kind of standards at these levels. It's not that as you go from left to right, so as you move from foundation to chartered fellow, you just get better at stuff. <laughs> you just get more clever at doing this. You just do more. That isn't, that isn't how, how, how this works. These are very distinct levels based on the type of work and the way you, more importantly, the way you approach your work. So we have what we call a maturity framework. So these are levels of maturity in the way sort of, of, of thinking and, and, and doing. So this is kind of the way it's constructed. So what you'll find is as you go from foundation to associate, associate to chartered member, chartered member to chartered fellow, in terms of how we describe these levels in the map, what you'll find is that your, the scope of your work increases, the impact of your work increases. Um, you, uh, you start to think in a different way. So you'll be starting to develop that thinking rather than just applying other people's thinking. So at foundation level, for example, your work is likely to be quite tactical. You'll be probably focused on quite day-to-day -day, um, tasks. Um, you'll probably gather information. You might use it in your role. But fundamentally, your work is probably, you're, you're delivering your work probably for your manager, your immediate team, maybe some immediate customers. Whereas at chartered fellow level, your work is um, much more likely to be almost entirely strategic in the thinking and the delivery. 
the impact of your work will be across the organization. It might have impact across the sector. It might have impact across the profession. You'll be developing evidence-based thinking to drive change in, within the profession. Um, and you'll be influencing a whole range of stakeholders, not just in your organization, but have a very external focus as well. So as you move from foundation through to chartered fellow, what you're moving through is a kind of a increasing your scope, increasing your influence, increasing your impact, changing the way you use your thinking, using more evidence-based thinking, developing thinking, um, and, um, uh, and making more evidence-based decisions. So that's the way the impact levels work. And so from, from your perspective, and when you come on to do some of the, some of the elements of the session later, and, and when Natalie is talking as well, um, what's always a really good thing to think about is which level is your role at currently? Which level are you at currently? What role best mirrors the work you do? Um, because if you know where you, where you are, <laughs> then it'll help you think about where do you want to get to? So I'm just going to take a couple of minutes, just very, very quickly, and I'm going to whiz through these, but we can share the slides with you after if, if, if you want them. I'm just going to whiz through these four ways to develop yourself against the map, and they will be very quick because I've only got a couple of minutes. But the first way is to broaden or deepen your knowledge and behaviours. So I said earlier about thinking about which, which level you're at. If you want to broaden or deepen your knowledge and behaviours, you'll be doing that at the level you're at currently. So to take that example of you know, the, the, the behavior of professional courage and influence, if you're at associate level, you would look down that, 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 uh, that column there for associate level and think, actually, how can I do those better? How can I improve myself in this area? You might want to take a new specialism and say, actually, I want to learn about this area at the level I'm at already. So one easy way is just to take the level you're at, have a look at all of the standards in all of the areas for the level you're at and think about how you can broaden and deepen your knowledge and behaviors in those areas. The second one is to increase your scope and impact. So going back to what I was saying about increasing your scope and impact is what happens when you develop yourself through the levels. So exactly the same thing. If you're at associate level now, instead of going down that column, what you want to do is look at the next level up. So have a look at chartered member level, perhaps pick two or three areas of the map. Don't try and do them all at once, <laughs> but pick two or three areas at the map at the next level up and think about actually, how can I improve my knowledge and my behaviors to get to this point? What do I need to do differently? What do I need to change? What do I need to learn in order to be demonstrating the next level up? Because it's looking at the next level that starts to broaden your scope, your impact, your influence, and the way you think and the way you behave and the way you deliver and becoming more, more strategic. So that's the second way. So first way, look at the level you're at. The second way is to look at the next level up. The third way is to use the standards to build your practice. And what I mean by that is taking an area of the map. So it, this is often works really well in the specialism. So let's take the, the talent management standards. And let's say again, you're at associate level. So you look down that associate column. And let's say you've been asked to review um, how you assess talent in your organization. You can take each of these standards and think, well, have I considered that? So if I look down these standards here, have I thought about in that work, have I thought about different approaches to developing talent at an individual and group level? Have I looked at tools to differentiate and assess and review talent? Have I considered the approaches we take for different populations? Have I thought about diversity within these talent pools? So it's almost using the standards as a bit of a checklist for have I thought about this within the work I'm being asked to do? So that's another way you can use the standards to build your practice. And the final way is using the values in your decisions and actions. So I said I'd come back to them very briefly. Um, so the first uh, value about being principles led. So is the decision you're making, are the things you're doing, are they the right things? Are you seeing beyond the rules and the processes to actually say, are we doing what's right as an organization? Am I doing what's right in my role? Okay, I, I can't change how we do things as an organization, but have I raised my concerns? And am I doing what I think is right in the best way possible? Being evidence-based, am I making my decisions based on um, uh, uh, the sort of rules of evidence-based practice? So looking at, um, looking at organization data and information, looking at stakeholders' needs, looking at professional expertise, looking at research. Am I taking all those sources and making decisions based on evidence? And finally, outcomes driven. Am I making a positive impact at work? Am I developing this policy just because we sort of feel we should? Or actually, am I doing work that's going to have a really positive outcome and really enable the business to do what they need to do to drive the business strategy and, 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 and to, to, 
to achieve our business goals. So making sure that your work has a positive impact, that you're creating value for your organisation. So that's a way you can use the values in your decision uh, and, and, and your actions. So those are four really quick ways. Look at the level you're at to broaden or deepen your knowledge. Look at the next level up if you want to increase your scope and your impact. Um, using the standards as, as a checklist for things, uh, for actions that you might want to take or things to consider when you're doing work and using the values in your decisions and actions. So that's a really quick um, kind of uh, quick uh, uh, whiz through the profession map, but hopefully that gives you sort of good overview. Core knowledge and behaviours apply to everyone um, and the specialist knowledge use as it works for you in your role. That's absolutely fine. Um, but I'll stop there because I think um, Natalie is going to go on to share about how she's used this uh, in her career specifically. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Mir. Really appreciate that. It was a, a really succinct and, and uh, really rich description. Uh, and, you know, really just reiterates the importance. If you, if you do follow these things, you can have a real significant impact with your career, can't you? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the other thing is I can't unsee the wig. You've now pointed oh, sorry. Out. I know. Once, once you've said it, if you're really <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Brilliant. So um, we're, we're going to have a Q&A uh, with Miriam and with Natalie once we've actually just had a quick conversation. We're going to have a, a, about a 15 to 20 minute conversation with, with Natalie and she's going to sort of share her experiences. Um, Andrea has already put a question in the chat box. So thank you so much for being first. Um, we really encourage you to ask any question, whether it's about the profession map, about your own career as well. Um, so, so Natalie, thank you so much for, for coming along today. Um, I guess what we really wanted to do is to, is to understand, you know, a little bit about your background and, and how you came to use the profession map in your career and how it's served you. But could you just give them, for the benefit of everyone here, um, just a little bit of background about yourself and, and how you came along to be invited today? <laughs> OK, so it was a random LinkedIn post how I ended up here today. So apologies in advance to everybody. Um, but um, no, it, it's fantastic to actually be here today. So thank you all for, for coming. And it's a pleasure to speak alongside Miriam. So thank you for having me. With, um, I, so I started my HR career as a HR administrator, so I was working for Woolworths PLC and I basically climbed the career ladder um, very slowly over a period of 16 years and up until a um, HR manager role for a PLC company and now I run my own HR consultancy, so it's my own business, and uh, yeah, so I'm very much a HR generalist, but operating at a strategic level. Brilliant, thank you. Um, obviously, just condensed an, an entire career in just a few moments, so we're going to just unpack a few of those bits there as well. Um, how how did you come across the profession map, and how did you start applying it? Okay, so um, I came across the profession map when I was um, studying my level five CIPD. Um, so I'm not a natural academic. I think I should put that out there because a lot of people will be thinking, do you have to be academic to use it? And you don't. It's all open to interpretation. Like Miriam has said, you have to embrace your own individual journeys. So when I was sat there studying, I was also in a, a role that I kind of felt stuck in. Um, so one of the main things that I wanted to do was to establish where I was, but also reflect upon where I'd come from in terms of my journey so far, because I think that's a really important part of our progression throughout our careers is to reflect upon what experiences have we touched upon? What do we enjoy doing? Because we're at work for X amount of time a day. We have to love what we do. So by having that aspect and that outlook, I was able to map where I had started and where I had come from and utilize the map to establish, I, I wanted to be a chartered member. I think that's a point that I missed. I wanted to be a chartered member and I was an associate and had been since 2012, so quite a long time. So I wanted to progress and I wanted to increase my membership with the CIPD, but I also wanted to progress my career by having that status, so to speak. So I actually printed off the guide to chartered member and what's expected of chartered member status. I went back through my CV to reflect upon experiences and to establish my gaps. But then I also used it to evidence where I was at that point, because that's really important. I also keep an up-to-date CPD log, even though I don't need to use it, it's an incredibly useful tool because then you can reflect upon things that you've, you've used, but that's just me, I'm a bit of a geek. So, um, but I find it really useful so that I can then establish those gaps and use those for how I need to in the future. 
Brilliant, thank you. Um, and and that's gone some of the way to actually answer one of the questions in the chat box, which is which is really useful. So, um, I guess the other question I wanted to ask is, um, how has the professional map actually supported your own sort of professional development, um, the HR team that you've been in, and and the organisation's overall success as well? Because you you when we were talking in the preparation for this, you shared that you actually started an HR team from scratch, and there were sort of some raw talent in there that that didn't have any sort of HR background, and that guided you, didn't it? We did. I think because when I started in HR, I was just thrown in the deep end. So I was shown this really dark room with lots of paper and said, right, can you make this into something, you know, we can use, which was all it turns out it was all the employee files. Um, and it was just a complete mess of <laughs> paperwork taller than I in there. So I remember when I recruited my team um, that I wanted that raw talent. I wanted people who wanted the opportunity in the same way, I suppose, how I did, but weren't necessarily given that through lack of experience or whatever their circumstances might have been. So when I recruited those individuals, I actually showed them the profession map and said, right, I don't want you to be in this position forever. You've told me that you want to progress, but you have to embrace your, your own path and how you want to progress yourself because you can show people the tools, but they have to enable themselves to be able to use it. That's where the accountability part of the profession map comes in. So I sat them down, I had regular one-to-ones with them and I helped them to progress through the profession map. So to help other people, I've used it in that way, but to answer your other point about how it's helped my own career, actually, I it was my first managerial job. I, I'm telling people and managers all the time how to manage people, but I'd never actually done it in practice myself. So I knew that that wasn't a particularly strong point. So again, I went to the map and pulled out what the expectations are so that I can effectively lead a team whilst ensuring that the business was getting what it needed from my department. So there was a whole load of stuff that comes into it because you don't just look at the internal factors. We also look at the external too. And, and I guess just a shameless plug here, but um, one of the things that we're looking at is you you actually captured all of these um, experiences in, in a book, didn't you? I did. Um, so I wrote and published um, Launch Your HR Career in November last year. So in the midst, of, I'm either crazy or stupid, but I decided to launch a business and publish a book in the same year, which was, you know, absolutely crazy when I look back at it. But life presents you with various opportunities and I was reflecting a lot upon the struggles that I'd had in the profession. I can't tell people how many rejections I've had, how many doors I've had closed on my face and you know but there's always a reason those doors close because the other the right one will open, it always does. So it's just about finding what's right for you at that point but also not to get hung up on things like job titles and being able to progress how you feel comfortable with. I always thought, like like Miriam was saying, that it was a linear process. So I'd go from HR admin and in 10 years, I'd be a HR director. And no steps involved. I would just slide on up there effortlessly um, and very gracefully. And it doesn't work out that way. If anything, those points have really helped. Um, so those struggles have really helped me to build resilience and to understand that, do you know what? Things don't always go our way. You can study to the ends of the earth, but you may not have a job at the end of it. You have to fight for that position. And that's very much what my journey has been. So when I put it all into the book, the aspiration was to be able to help people that thought, actually, I am a little bit stuck and I want to be able to progress, but I just don't know how. So the loads of people have come back to me and they said, you know, I've used your book in so many different ways. And it's really helpful to, to see that. So, you know, I'm really right. pleased with that. Great. And and to get super tactical now, because it, it's one thing to understand the profession map, but it's another thing to actually help you guide um, your process. And, and in the in the build up just this um, this session today, um, one of the things that uh, Miriam was sharing with us is that you know one of the things that the profession really struggles with is is sometimes around the, the you know the core knowledge of like change and stuff. Um, when we were talking about it, we sort of talked about is there any sort of specific examples where you've used the profession map and it's actually helped you develop a uh, a skill or a competence to actually help you. And one of those things was about developing business cases, wasn't it? So you could get the investment in your team to, to move it forward. Yeah, so a lot of people, um, so th there's a lot of times I wish that I'd had that map 
early on in my career to be able to understand why um, certain things had happened. I didn't have a traditional start in HR. Um, I was actually a travel agent before I went into HR. Um, so there was also these, uh, you know, the, the, the moments that we have. So when we're looking at, I, I don't know, say like the current um, skill shortage, when I was a HR manager, we had an aging workforce. So we you know we looked at it and we're like people aren't learning trades at colleges anymore there's not people coming out of education and things like that so that this caused a great period of change in that business because they're a building products manufacturer so you know and the housing is obviously in demand so those products need to be there but the issue was is that people are more inclined to go into uh, you know more technological jobs now whereas this is a very hands-on you know practical role so to be able to find people that make bricks is not easy. So the only pipeline they really had was through apprenticeship schemes and graduate schemes, but also looking at local colleges that had trades, which have subsequently dried up. So when you're putting together a business case, the way that I went into um, and utilized the map was to look at that change function because I had a very imposing team of directors looking at me saying Natalie how, HR how do we fix this <laughs> and I'm like well I can't just magic people out of nowhere or clone employees because that's very frowned upon and outright illegal but um we have a situation where you need to put that case forward so one of the ideas was to increase the offering to a wider area because quarries are in quite remote areas so we had to look at a business case for if we get people from the outside how do we get them in but also, you don't understand your capabilities until you're put into that corner. And as a HR professional, I'm stood in that room and I'm like, do you know what? I've got to make this change. I'm not sure how to do it, but I will certainly, you know, find a way to be able to do it. So I didn't just call upon the profession map. I One of the bits that I'd learned from the map was to strengthen my network as well. So I also reached out to the wider HR community that may have had similar struggles. Um, so that I could effectively lead my team, but also put a strategy in place that would better the organisation. But one of the key principles that I learned from that was actually the value of HR, because when things are going wrong, people will come to HR and go, yeah, how do we fix this? What's the way forward? And you may not always know the answer. It might be that you have to really get involved and try and find the answers yourself or from your network or get ideas from people because that's when the collaborative side of things of, or the, the part of the wig comes into play. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, and it's really good because the chat box is really warming up now. And, and Miriam's been great and actually sort of proactively dealing with some of those questions. So please carry on, Miriam. That's absolutely brilliant. Um, we just want to leave people with um, three tips. Um, obviously, Miriam shared her tactical tips, which are really, really useful. But if you wanted to leave um, three tips for the people that have joined us today, what would those things be to help them take that next step? I think, first of all, don't put too much pressure on yourself. and take time to have a look at your journey so far. That part was really invaluable for me because I not only learned a lot about myself and what I liked, um, but also established what my weak points were. So I then, my second point is to look at the profession map and make a list of three things or your three gaps that you want to improve on. So when you're looking at that dream job description that's advertised on a website somewhere, you want to be able to demonstrate those points, but it's only by reflecting that we can understand how we can then apply that knowledge to that dream role. Um, but the last part of that, so tip number three would be to identify what the next steps would be for you and to take certain actions or little steps towards making that happen. Excellent. Well, well, thank you so much. And we are absolutely bang on schedule. So thank you for that. I'm, I'm going to invite Miriam back in, if that's OK. Um, so we've got some questions just coming in the chat box. So what we've done is we, we've scheduled about 10 minutes um, to actually just have some Q&A. Um, so I'll ask the questions and you're both really welcome just to join in as well. So just there's one question that came from from Morris, uh, Gaby or Gabby. Um, and it was great to hear your experience, Natalie. How did you take that step from, from thinking in an operational way to being more strategic? I think when, it's a really good question. 
but the way that it worked for me was me to fully understand the business and what was happening and what the pain points were. That's a lot of ands. But um, it, it's all about looking at how you can add that value. And the only way that you can operate strategically is to identify those potential solutions to their problems um, and give them options as well if you can, because what the desired outcome for the business might be could be quite different to the ideal solution that you may have thought of so i use a lot of my commercial knowledge for that brilliant is mirrors is anything else you want to add to that yeah i th i think that kind of move from operational to strategic that i guess i would say two things about that i would say a part of it is a mindset and it's about you have to be able to think in that way and not every role will necessarily allow for that because some you know if you are very operational in your role very tactical in your role Sometimes it could be quite hard to do that strategic thinking. Um, but so I think I, I think being in a role that allows you to do that in the first place really, really helps. Um, but I think that the, the 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 strategic thing I would, I mean, the thing I would always point people to is, you know, a bit to kind of Natalie's point is for me, it's this sort of evidence-based practice critical thinking approach. Somebody presents you with a problem, they say, okay, you know, I'm really struggling to recruit people in my area of the business don't jump to the solution straight away it's not okay well let's recruit people it, it's having a mindset of saying okay well what really is the problem what's causing that problem what's creating that problem what else links to that problem so actually what problem do we need to solve in order to resolve this issue what is that issue a symptom of and so i guess it's being able to take a step back and ask the right questions kind of see see through the get past the red herring see through all that kind of uh you know stuff that isn't really the problem and actually really understand what the problem is and then say actually if we solve that what business value is that going to create so for me it's about taking a step back it's not the operational the doing stuff in the middle it's the stuff at the beginning asking the right question and looking at the end and will what we do create value for that area of the business if it doesn't let's not do it so it's about, for me it's about that kind of mentality and that kind of thinking not jumping to a solution Absolutely. Really great points, isn't it? It's, it's so because because HR is so, such a busy role, isn't it? It's very easy to get super transactional, super tactical. Yeah. And it's almost giving yourself space, isn't it? To think. And even when you're in a strategic role, it is so easy to jump into doing because that's so satisfying to tick things off at the end of the day and go, I've done it. And actually what it really needed was quite a lot of thinking. Um, and it's very difficult to get space to think. Very difficult to do that. Yeah. Building on, that, I think this whole strategic thing has just struck a note with a couple, few people. So uh, Cinnamon Tomlinson has asked the question, I'm currently studying in a hospitality management role. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm currently in a hospitality management role studying towards my level five CIPD. I'm from a very operational role and I'm looking to gain experience in a strategic role. However, finding it difficult to gain the opportunity. Oh, good question. No, I'll hand over to you, Miriam, as well. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it is tricky. And I, I think what I would always encourage is if you find that your role doesn't allow for that, two things. One, um, sometimes you can find opportunities within organisations and so not necessarily your role, but find other opportunities. So I can see there's a project going on over there. I know it's not part of my role, but could I go and support on that for my own development? Um, secondly, I think something you can do in your role you know, with or without your manager's support, but obviously with your manager's support or a mental support is, is, is often more helpful is to, one thing you can do is even within the work that you're doing, if you're being asked to do something, so you're being asked to implement something or, you know, a directive has come down, right, this is our approach to performance management, this is our approach to L&D, can you make this happen, is for you to take a step back and look at it and you question it and you ask the things that you, you know, if you were in that role, what questions would you ask? Ask that L&D person, ask that person who's asked you to do it, what value would that add to the business? Help me understand how this is going to change the way we do things. Help me understand actually what questions you had to ask in order to know that this is the right thing to do. Because the more that you ask of other people, A, you're challenging them and you're challenging their thinking, but also you're learning and you're starting to think in that way and learn from them about the way they've come up with those solutions. So I think it's a... It, it's not necessarily easy to just be able to do that in your role, but I think you can, you can ask those questions, you can, you can start to learn, and then you start to demonstrate that you're doing with that thinking within your job as far as you can, but appreciate that can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Definitely. As to, to Miriam's point, sorry, um, was to 
say that my, my exposure to strategy was actually by complete accident. I was asked by um, my business partner to sit in on a meeting with the directors and to take notes. That was my only job, was to sit there and take minutes. And it wasn't until I started going through the meeting, I was like, well, actually, we could possibly do that. That could be an answer because I had my finger on the pulse through various CIPD events and conferences I was going to and all sorts. So I was like, well, actually, we could do this or maybe we could do this. So I then looked at that afterwards and I went with the business partner to meet with the CEO and he, she said, look, Natalie's come up with these potential solutions. What do you think of them? And are we on the right track? And he said, wow, I'm really, you know, he was really impressed with it. And I was in charge of that part of it ever since. So it's, um, it also helps you to gauge that vital relationships with the right people as well in the organization. So when we're operating at a strategic level and getting involved in the, in the doing, the other opportunity is actually, do you know what, do we need to be at our desks the whole day? Or do we find out where the pain points are with our people or with our you know our organization and that's the, my desk was the last place that I was because I was getting that that knowledge and that information from my my people brilliant <clears throat> I almost want to keep going deeper with that question but we just had another question coming from um, from Sue Can and that was to Miriam and to Natalie as well so um hi can you provide any tips on how to get promoted from HR advisor to HR manager externally if one does not have external ex uh, direct experience of managing a team. Um, I have supervisory experience of, of an individual, but that was over 10 years ago. So how do you make that leap from HR advisor to HR manager if you don't have experience of, uh, of managing a team directly and you're doing it externally? So I guess the first thing I would say is obviously not all HR manager roles will manage a team. Um, so there's always the opportunity for to, to look for those roles. There's plenty of standalone HR roles out there. But otherwise, I would say if that's really important to you and that you're finding that that's a need in the roles you're looking at, um, A, volunteer in your organisation if you can to take on management responsibility if someone ask. Say, this is something I really want to learn. Can I do that? But if, if not, if that's not an opportunity in your organisation, um, there are plenty of opportunities volunteering perhaps within your organisation or with some of our networks like our Steps Ahead Mentoring Network to mentor and guide new people in your organization. Um, it, they don't even have to be in HR. It could be um, using like a, a buddy system in your organization to help onboard people into the organization, start mentoring more junior HR people, students, for example, via your, via your local universities. Um, and that way you can start to build up some of that experience. It might not be full management experience, but you're demonstrating that enabling of people to start building their own, you know, building their capability, which is, of course, part, well, one of the most important parts of a, of a management role. That's, that would be my best advice. Natalie? So, yeah, it, it's really, it, I think it always depends on opportunity rather than title. I, I can't emphasize that enough because when I was operating at HR advisory level, I was actually working myself flat out at a business partner level. I just didn't have the title or the pay to reflect it. Mm. So it's really important that you go for the right role, not just a particular title. So have a look at, um, I've actually worked with Steps Ahead since 2013, I've been a volunteer for, and I didn't have any coaching or mentoring or management experience during that time. And I found that really helpful when I applied um, for my first HR manager role externally. So um, I was very, I think you always have to be aware of the environment you're in currently, um, purely on the basis of I was in one role for about four and a half years and I was, you know, just plodding along is probably the, the best term to use. And I'm not saying this is everybody's experience, but what I found was that I was getting a bit frustrated with the lack or opportunity for progression. And I was always looking internally rather than actually is it something that my company should be recognizing? Because they're not, if they don't know your job, they're not going to know what your, you know, just as long as the job gets done generally, they, they don't mind. But, um, you know, you have to seek out if there is a prospect opportunity first internally before you start looking externally. But if that, you know, sometimes you have to ask some very difficult questions of yourself and if that is the right move for you. So I would always look at all of the factors before making that move and do your research thoroughly beforehand. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, 
Uh, Mira, I know we've only got you until one uh, till twelve fifty today, um, and we're very. Uh, are we okay? Just to give you one more question. Is that yeah, okay? that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we're, we're trying to be as greedy as we can with you. So um, we've got a, a message from from Iqbal, um, and and it's I want to get a job in HR, and I have experience of recruitment. I'm also doing CIPD level five. Which role should I go for? Now it's, it's a big. There's a lot of context probably behind that question, but I guess it's that kind of that kind of entry level into HR. Um, with sort of recruitment, which is a sort of a similar background, but um, I guess what, what might be your starts and also for Natalie as well? Well, I would go back to Natalie's point that she just made about actually, you know, I, I would say, you know, what do you mean by HR? First of all, I would say, you know, to me, the HR, the people profession includes recruitment. So I would include recruitment and resourcing in that. So I think if you've got a recruitment background, you're already working in, in that wider profession. So for me, to Natalie's point that she just articulated very well is, actually what role do you really want what's right for you not um well I've got a I, I, I think to sort of think I just want to get in I think if you've got a background in recruitment you you, you already are partly in so if I would say it's about actually think about what job you want and then think about and look at what are your gaps to get there I think if you want a more specific answer and you're sort of thinking, well, I don't really have time to do that. And uh, or I just want to know what the kind of easiest routes in are. I would say, to be honest, if we're talking about a generalist HR role, I think it's quite tricky to get into a sort of VP or middle management role without experience at advisor level. So I think probably if you have experience in recruitment, it might be coming into a, perhaps it's an in-house HR role with a resourcing team within an organization that works within the HR team or perhaps looking at an HR advisory role, or equally, if you do have quite a lot of recruitment experience, um, perhaps a sort of talent advisor role as well, in, in where they've got those in larger organizations where there's perhaps more of a, of a recruitment assessment side to it. So it could be something with a sort of talent, but it, I, I would say to get into a middle management role in HR, you do you do need to have that experience at sort of advisory level, be quite tricky with it. Fantastic. Thank you. So, what a great answer to, <laughs> to, to a question. Uh, Natalie, just a final comment for you and then we'll, we'll go to the next section. Sure. The other factor that I would put on that would be to possibly explore any um, graduate or apprenticeship opportunities because there's quite a few um, larger organisations that do offer that as a route in, but they also support further studies and progression, um, you know, further on depending on the size and, and budgets of that organisation. So don't overlook those um, prospect opportunities. I've had to do it myself where I had to take a step down to be able to then progress further on. So like Miriam said earlier, it's anything but linear. It, it, it's, uh, it's the challenge that makes us, that's for sure.